Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here talking to all of you. There is a question I always ask people, especially if I'm doing an interview, and it's what is it that drives you? What is it that makes you wake up every day and feel really excited to, excited to do what you're set to do? And this morning I woke up and I decided to reflect a little bit and what was it that drove me to move to San Diego a few years ago and start working in the field of synthetic genomics? And what is it that still drives me every day and makes me really excited about what I do? And there are two things. One is the incredible people I get a chance to work and interact with every day. People really trying to make a difference. Second is that it matters to me that we're working on creating solutions to some of the biggest problems facing humanity today. And I wanted to share some of that with all of you. So you're all familiar with the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century. You've all been involved with the Digital Revolution of the 20th century. And today I wanted to talk about the Genomics Revolution of the 21st century. And biology is more analogous to the digital world than you would think. DNA is the software of life. All of characteristics of the living cells and all of their functions are encoded within the genetic code, the DNA. And programming computer software has become trivial today, but biologists are actually now behaving as software engineers and using the tools of the digital world to actually create live software, or what we like to call them, biological operating systems, creating solutions for certain industries today. And those solutions are actually needed. You probably follow that on October 31st, global population reached 7 billion people. By 2050, we expect to have 9, maybe 10 billion people in the planet. Not only are we going to have more people, but they're demanding actually more energy, more protein in their diets. And we already have a challenge fulfilling all the needs of the existing population. We're now trying to find ways to fulfill the needs of this growing population and to do so in a sustainable fashion and biology will be part of that solution. And biology has been actually part of our lives. It started thousands of years before present. We we're already using fermentation processes to create two of my favorite things in the world, bread and wine. But it wasn't until about 30 years ago that the first drug based on recombinant DNA, human insulin, was approved for commercialization. And it wasn't until 15 years ago that the first genetically modifi modified plant was introduced in the market. But history actually shows that biology can be used at scale. And at this stage, you're probably wondering where my accent is from. And I actually grew up in Brazil, who is today the world's first sustainable biofuels economy. And that didn't happen in a day. It started with investment from the government from the 70s. But Brazil has managed to displace 50% of the gasoline consumption by using biological processes and ethanol fermented from sugarcane. So there are reasons to believe this can be used at scale. But it's also a good reminder that all of that was done using very basic techniques in biology. And today, our understanding of biology is much bigger, and we have the right tools to create very innovative solutions. In terms of the understanding of biology, it all started back in 1995 when we sequenced the first genome. But since then, thousands of new genomes have been sequenced. And, just to, and that has been derived from progress in the technology and a significant drop in the cost of sequencing. And just to provide an illustration, when the Human Genome Project was set, it was expected that it was going to take over 10 years and $3 billion to get it done. Celera Genomics managed to do that in nine months and using about $100 million. Today, a human genome can be sequenced for less than $10,000, and we're expecting that soon it's going to cost less than $1,000 to get it done. This is how sequencing rooms used to, work in the used to look in the past. Today, they're more like this bench top sequencing machines that can do in a day what would it have taken many days and hundreds of sequencers to do in the past. And scientists have moved beyond that. They moved beyond sequencing the genomes of specific organisms to try to understand the genetic diversity in different environments. And here's an example is the Global Ocean Sampling Expedition from the Venter Institute. They went around the world collecting water samples. Here's a map of what they have been. And as a result of that work, 80 million new genes have been discovered to date. So people have been mastering the techniques on how to read the genetic code. And now scientists have taken the next step and start actually writing the genetic code. So I included here the picture of these three very good looking scientists whom I have the honor of working with. And they've been actually making significant contributions in the space. On the left is Ahem Smith, who won the Nobel Prize in 1978. 
based on the discovery of restriction enzymes, which are molecular scissors that cut DNA in specific locations. On his side is Craig Venter, my boss, who became very famous in 2001, based on his efforts decoded in human genome. And on the right side, uh, Dan Gibson, who created the Gibson assembly method, a very efficient tool uh, to assemble large pieces of DNA. And all of the efforts of these three generations of scientists converged last year, and I included here the front page of their publication, when they announced the creation of the first synthetic cell, which is a cell fully controlled by a genome that has been chemically synthesized. I like to say that they are now like the ultimate biological software engineers. Uh, they like to say that this cell actually is the first species to have the computer as its parent. Um, and although this is great proof of concept of what science can do, we started now applying all of those solutions towards problems that are relevant to the industry. So we are starting with the computer screen, designing and synthesizing not only uh, synthetic pathways, but whole new synthetic chromosomes and genomes, and creating the biological operating system of the cells that do what we want them to do. For example, take different sources of carbon, like CO2, plant biomass, or coal, and transform those carbon sources into value-added products like medicine, food, or chemicals. And very relevant, all those 80 million and many more new genes that have been discovered are now becoming the design components of the future. So to make an analogy, in the past, people had few units of resistors, capacitors, and transistors to create a revolution in electronics. And we now have these many more building blocks to create the revolution in biology. And I'm going to show you actually the example of how we're using those tools to address two very important problems in the industry today. The first one is we're working with microalgae, tiny green creatures that are actually the most productive agricultural crop today. And to provide an illustration, um, I use the number, if we were to replace all the gasoline consumption from the city of uh, San Diego using corn, ethanol, and different crops, how much land would be needed? And I realized that using corn-based ethanol, we would need, need about 10 Salton seeds. If we are using algae, using actually very conservative estimates, uh, we would be needing only one Salton seed. But not only that, algae can actually grow on land that's not suitable for agriculture, agriculture, so it could indeed be grown in the Salton Sea. It does not require fresh water, and most important, it takes CO2 as a feedstock. And what we're doing with our tools now is actually improving the biological operating system of this algae so that it can do that in a much more efficient way and potentially supply the needs of San Diego using a fraction of the size of the Salton Sea, maybe one-seventh, um, and actually tailoring so that the algae can make products that are more relevant to the industry today. New food, new food oils, new proteins, new uh, fuels. Another use of this technology is to create the next generation influenza vaccine. Today, it takes the industry about 35 days since WHO releases the information on the vir influenza virus for the vaccine that year until the industry can produce a vaccine seed stock. What we're doing is getting that inf digital information on the genetic code of the virus, chemically synthesizing it, and having a vaccine seed stock ready in five days. So not only we're cutting the time, but we're making the process much more efficient, we're creating much more vaccine, um, much higher yields, and a much safer process. And of course, mo most importantly, we're saving many new lives. And I finish here, actually, with a quote from the Royal Academy of Engineering, actually acknowledging the power of synthetic biology, addressing some of these new challenges facing humanity, and the contribution that synthetic biology will be making for the economies of the world. Thank you.